Greetings and various assorted salutations. Um, welcome to the next lecture on World War II Part 2 for uh, the series. Uh, today we're looking at North Africa and the early Pacific. Last time we talked of home and now we're off to war. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Um, essentially, in the early days of World War II, America didn't quite have certain victory yet. Um, with wars on two fronts, America and her allies would have to juggle foes who already controlled much of the field, and they were expecting company. Um, here's some key terms in case you need them. Um, please note that they may differ from the list that you have um, in your assignments or study guides. But let's break down the war on two fronts and get a good picture of things. Uh, with Japan and Germany declaring war on the U.S., um, that means there's a war in the Pacific and there's going to be a European theater. Let's break down the theaters. Um, first up, we have the European theater. Uh, this was going to be the main focus of America um, with the Europe first strategy. Essentially take out the Nazis and then the Japanese can come later. Uh, major opponents are going to be Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy. Um, and the continent, uh, continental Europe, the Atlantic Ocean, and North Africa are going to be where most of the battles are fought in the European theater. So it's a pretty big theater, um, but it's got some very separate aspects to it. Um, as our lecture slides noted, North Africa is almost considered its own field, and certainly the Soviets felt that way. Um, allies in the region include the British Empire, based out of um, these areas, out of the British Isles. Additionally, there is some support from British India, if you can maintain the Suez Canal. Uh, the USSR is also another ally in this area. Um, they're bitter about Operation Barbarossa, and they're fighting on the infamous Eastern Front. Also, another ally we have are various resistance groups, such as ones located in France. Um, there's other groups located in Poland and um, other areas. Now, the key challenges to the European theater is that there's a lack of holdings in continental Europe. Essentially, the Nazis control, um, they control France and, and with Italy controlled as well. The Allies are going to have to fight their way into Europe before they can actually fight their way to Berlin. Um, additionally, German U-boats will patrol the Atlantic, and they will attack any ship that they find on the high seas. Here's a map if you just want a general survey of things. Um, I always remember I do post the slides to these um, in the YouTube description below, and it'll be available um, when I project it into my classes. But essentially, the big challenge America would have to have is everything would have to be shipped. So the U.S. Navy, um, U.S. Merchant Marine would have to expand dramatically to address these problems. Now let's jump over to the Pacific Theater. Um, the major opponent is um, the Empire of Japan, though they did have some support from Thailand and Indian nationalists. However, the main opponent Americans are fighting are the Japanese. The places where the fighting takes place is in China, the Pacific Ocean, and many European and American colonies such as Hong Kong, Burma, and the Philippines. And also there's dozens of small little islands between Alaska, Australia, Hawaii, and the Japanese home islands. The allies in this area, um, the United States' biggest ally, and is often the most overlooked, unfortunately, is Australia. It has a bit more independence than the British Empire, and um, before the Pacific War really broke out, you could find Australians on practically every battlefield, it seemed. They were supporting the British Empire very closely. Uh, we do have China in this area. The Chinese are divided into, well, two major factions are operating in there. You've got the Chinese Nationalists and the Chinese Communists. Um, the ones that would eventually go on to fa found Taiwan and um, the modern-day China. Um, also, the British empires in this area, though they're, operate, they're going to be operating in limited numbers uh, because they are largely cut off from the uh, British Isles, and many of these colonies have been battered quite a bit. 
Um, the key challenges to this region is that battles will require tons of coordination with Navy and ground forces. Almost every single major battle is an amphibious operation where troops have to land on the beaches, often with those Higgins boats, um, and fight their way in. There's jungle combat, um, which is really problematic because with the loss of the Philippines, um, the U.S., it took a while to reorganize our anti-malaria um, uh, treatments. Um, we had to coordinate more with South America to get to replace our anti-malaria quinine um, medication. Also, jungle combat is brutal, unrelenting, and um, very wet. A lot of people stuff, whether it's boots um, or skin, has a tendency of not doing well in wet climates. It's also a massive land area. Um, China, Southeast Asia, Pacific Ocean. It's about one-eighth of the planet Earth is where the Japanese Empire is fighting. Um, there's a lack of, it, there's lack of uh, resources um, because most of America's infrastructure is on the eastern seaboard. The western seaboard, California, will build up, but it doesn't start off as this massive um, industrial capacity area, high capacity area. Most of our famous naval shipyards are located on the eastern seaboard. Um, the Allies are hard pressed in this region as well. They've been fighting for a very, very long time and it's, they're very tired. The Chinese have more or less been fighting World War II since before World War II began with the Sino, Second Sino-Japanese War. Um, and the British and Australia is under threat of invasion um, in, er, in, in the 40s, early 40s. Here's a general map. Once again, you can access these things um, in the links below. But also, right after Pearl Harbor, Burma, Hong Kong, Singapore, and the Philippines would rapidly be would rapidly lose lots of ground because the Japanese they would knock Pearl Harbor and then they'd go after these different places. So it was a major problem. So. Um, First off, though, the Allies, um, the U.S. and the Allies decide that Europe first is the main concern. The European theater needs to be closed out first. And so Italy and Germany have to go. Um, Germany was, of course, considered the biggest threat um, during this war. But let's talk about the early Pacific Front um, on the defensive, I like to think about it. Um, talking about the Pacific, these are dark times. Um, Pearl Harbor is picking up the ruins. The Japanese have, are taking Hong Kong, Singapore, and the Philippines are going to fall. Guam gets taken. Um, most of the resources and troops are getting ready to go invade Europe through North Africa. And so um, recapturing a lot of the lost territories is unthinkable in the early 1942. Uh, the Japanese Empire ruled from the Solomon Islands all the way down to, all the way up or down, depending on you look at a globe, um, all the way to islands trailing off the coast of Alaska. Um, the Americans' highlight in this, these dark times um, is the Doolittle Raid. Uh, for vengeance at Pearl Harbor, the USS Hornet launches the U.S. Army medium bomber, uh, pictured here, B-25s. These are not built to be launched from aircraft carriers. I uh, certainly can't land on them, so it's a one-way trip. Um, James Doolittle is going to be leading an attack to directly bomb Tokyo. Um, but it's a near suicidal mission that requires the U.S. Navy to risk half of its carrier fleet operating in the Pacific for one bomb run um, in, on mainland Japan. The damage done is minimal, um, but it got the Japanese to realize that Americans um, are determined and they could and would strike anywhere. And it's one of the early bright spots for the Allies at um, the start of the uh, early months of the war. Now, the Pacific is a defensive fight at first. Uh, the goal is to prevent the Japanese from completely taking certain areas. Um, but Allied Command um, decided that, and that's when we're talking about Allied Command in the Pacific, we're mainly talking about the Americans, the Australians, and the New Zealanders. Uh, they needed to stall the Japanese advance. Um, 
and they needed to defend several key areas. So Hong Kong, that was an acceptable loss, if you can call it that, but they needed to hold on to the Hawaiian Islands, American Samoa, and the entire continent of Australia. Um, lose these territories, and Japan would seem on near unstoppable. But we'll talk about Samoa. Uh, the loss of Samoa, which Samoa is pictured here, it would mean that Australia and New Zealand would be cut off from the United States um, direct contact. Essentially, if, Americans, if Samoa was taken, um, the Japanese could use it as a launching point to blockade Australia. Um, in fact, at, at the height of the war, there were more U.S. Marines than native Samoans on these islands, um, defending this, these islands. Now, well, there's some of the defenses. Perhaps one of the most important decisive battles, um, well, it wasn't, it didn't feel decisive, but it was an important battle nonetheless, was the Battle of Coral Sea, or the defense of Australia. That's the best way to think of it. Uh, the Japanese intended to take port, this port here, and if they took it, that would be the perfect place to launch a direct assault, a direct amphibious invasion on Australia. Um, at this point early on in the war, there was a great deal of concern in Australia and the United States that um, the United States, by the time they got to the Pacific to really focus on it, we'd have to retake Australia before wrapping, rolling up the entire Japanese Empire. And so the Battle of Coral Sea is incredibly important. Um, this is in May of 1942. And it represents the first aircraft carrier duel uh, in history. Uh, the naval battle, the ships never f directly faced off with each other. It was all about positioning aircraft carriers and running bombing and torpedo runs. Um, and essentially the, the navy fought, the navy, the two navies fought a game of cat and mouse with one another. Um, it was a costly battle for America. We lost one of our four aircraft carriers in the area, the USS, and the USS Yorktown got pretty beat up in the fighting. Um, and really what ends the Battle of the Coral Sea is both sides kind of get worn out and it ends in a draw. The Allies come out ahead, however, because the port holds and the Japanese lose a lot of the momentum that they had to really invade Australia. And so it's, it's a draw, but strategically America and Australia really come out ahead. Uh, rolling on to the next battlefield, that's essentially what we're doing today is rolling between battlefields. Uh, we've got the Battle of Midway. Uh, the Battle of Midway is essentially the defense of Hawaii, if you want to think of it that way. It's a teeny little island, um, and the concern was is Midway, if the Japanese took Midway, the U.S. would um, have to deal with the fact that they lost much of their Pacific fleet in trying to defend this rock, um, and it would greatly hamper America's ability to launch ships and troops um, out of Hawaii. Um, and so that was why Midway was con very concerning. Um, but, no, and this was in June of 1942. And essentially, this is often considered the turning point, the Battle of Midway. Uh, Admiral Ch Chester Nimitz uh, used the magic um, information that we had. The Allies essentially had, cr the Americans had cracked the Japanese secret code, and um, it's a fascinating story, but essentially U.S. Um, intelligence with Project Magic uh, figured out that Midway was a really important island and that the Japanese were getting ready to just hammer that island. And so the, um, the Allies, the Americans, put up a, a valiant defense that the Japanese never dreamed would be found at Midway. Um, uh, at that battle, U.S. aircraft just battered the Japanese fleet, um, and the U.S. did lose the USS Yorktown, um, but we took out four Japanese aircraft carriers in the, in the process. And defeat at Midway caught the Japanese, cost the Japanese dearly. It pinned them down and prevented really any more major serious offenses that could threaten the U.S. and Australia's ability to operate in the Pacific. Um, so it's a very important um, moment in the battle. Here's some photography from this battle. 
the carrier landing. They use that little hook down there to basically um, catch themselves on the deck of the um, aircraft carrier. If they miss, right into the ocean. But Now let's go into the European theater. Um, we're going to look at North Africa and Operation Torch. Um, heading over to Africa, uh, where the, where the British, the British and the Americans, the Allies, figured the Italians would be a lot easier to knock out than, um, the Nazis would. And essentially the idea was, is that the Allies could drive up into Europe through the south, while the Soviets battered away on the Nazis from the eastern front. Um, the invasion of North Africa, Operation Torch, begins in kind of the summer and fall of 1942. Um, but British troops are going to come out of Egypt as well as invade through the Pillars of Hercules um, or the Strait of Gibraltar is where troops will pass through into the Mediterranean from the Atlantic um, and they will take on Italy now Italy is not a fully industrialized Axis power and so it's going to be really have a hard time holding out against the British Empire, who is a fully industrialized country. And then when the U.S. enters the conflict, uh, things get really ugly for Italy. Uh, because Italy is, they've never fully industrialized, so many of their, um, their tanks are smaller, their factories are not as, are, aren't cranking out as much. Um, and so they're just never quite in the same position that the Germans, the French, uh, the United States, um, or the British are, or the Japanese for that matter. Um, unfortunately for the Allies, to reinforce the battered Italian army, the Nazis sent their crack commander, uh, Erwin Rommel. Uh, though his fame is originally from World War I as a daring infantry commander, uh, incidentally enough in the Italian front during World War I, um, Rommel turned out to be a really skilled panzer tank commander as well. And he was really good at uh, running a blitzkrieg in the desert. And German forces would actually threaten to drive the British out of North Africa in the darkest hours. Um, in fact, Erwin Rommel earned the nickname Desert Fox because he was very crafty and was good at popping out of nowhere. But he commanded the Africa Corps. And yes, that is the German spelling of it. Um, but, no. And as a skilled commander, Erwin Rommel would kind of, and the Italians would kind of prove that um, the Italians were not the soft underbelly the Allies were quite hoping for. Um, it would take the a British general, Bernand Montgomery, General Montgomery, um, and his troops would gain the nickname the Desert Rats, and they would hold the line and beat back the Nazis in October of 42. Uh, so it was a struggle of very famous generals. But here's kind of a map of where the different fights are going on. Um, but, no. There's a Africa Corps soldier in desert gear and the Africa Corps um, in some place, I think. But no. Now the Al uh, the Americans, the US finally arrives in the European slash African theater in November. And American troops actually didn't fight the Italians or the Nazis first. Rather, we landed in northwestern Africa at Casablanca, and the first European foe we faced, uh, the Americans faced, was the French. Well, the Vichy French. Uh, Vichy France was a puppet government controlled by the Nazis, and they would, uh, they would put up some of the first defenses against American and British invasions in the former colonies. Um, the, the former colonies that were under the French government were transitioned over to the Vichy government. Um, now, the fighting would go much slower than the Allies had hoped, um, but the Allies doggedly fought the Vichys, the Germans, and the Italians, and pushing hard, they would eventually surround the Nazi Africa Corps in Tunisia. Um, Nazi troops, uh, the toughest, the toughest forces, uh, in the area would lose North Africa, lose in North Africa later in 1942. We'll bring this up, I think, in the next lecture. Part of the reason for this is, dis is um, uh, 
The German troops down there never really had a lot of supplies because the Eastern Front fighting the Soviets required more supplies. And so the Germans, uh, even though they were limited in supplies, uh, provided to be a major nuisance and made the North Africa Campaign Law and Operation Torch run a bit longer than anyone really anticipated. Um, in any case, um, we've entered the war where the fighting has begun, and I'll stop this little battle survey right here. There's some activities that you're going to look at uh, in the class that will go into more detail about different battles and events and people um, that flesh out more of the early days of World War II. But if you want a quick summary, in the Pacific, the goal is to hold on, um, preserve Australia, hold, keep the Hawaiian territories open, uh, and just prevent the Japanese from expanding too much. And in um, the European, early European theater, the goal is to beat up the Italians, but it turns out it's going to be not as easy as everyone had hoped. Uh, in any case, until later.